And um, <clears throat> assuming that the same people are attending now as they were before, um, you, know, you may recall that I gave three lectures on white bars. And uh, white bars are compact objects. And we saw that they have a radius of about 6,000 kilometers and a mass close to the mass of the sun. And the, the more dense compact object, of course, is, uh, are the neutron stars, who again have a mass similar to the solar mass. And, uh, but their radius is just 10 kilometers. Okay, so which means that the density inside them is so high that it reaches nuclear densities, atomic nuclear densities. So now, today we are going to talk about the most dense objects, uh, black holes, and in fact, which are uh, infinitely dense. I mean, they are formally infinitely dense. So they are not like normal objects at all. And um, uh, they are mathematical and physical singularities. So one would expect that, um, one would expect to reject any theory in which such singularities occur, or at least like in quantum electrodynamics and so on, find ways of getting rid of the infinities. But no such thing is possible here. And we have come to uh, live with black holes. And in fact, they are becoming more and more a part of practical reality. So um, black holes come in different varieties of mass. And I'm going to talk to you about a few of those different varieties, not all of them. Uh, and then uh, uh, maybe if time permits, a little bit about uh, the theoretical matters attached to them. So my... <coughs> What I got here is an introduction, and then the theory of black holes, meaning some of the things which I need, not the uh, not the real theory. Then we'll talk about stellar mass black holes, and then supermassive black holes. Then the other two kinds of black holes, broadly speaking, are intermediate mass black holes and mini black holes. Now it's very unlike. I'll be making some remarks on intermediate mass black holes and dismiss mini black holes in just one, one or two sentences. Because there's the only way in which I could do justice to uh, the main black holes which are now been detected. That are, the, that are the stellar mass and supermassive black holes. Right, so. Uh, uh, Right. So now, uh, <clears throat> so black hole mass. So that's a very important parameter. And you must, have, you must have been told about the theory of astrophysics of stars. Okay, and there uh, you will again have found that mass is the governing parameter. So the entire life cycle of a star uh, is completely determined from its mass, except for small changes which can occur because mm -hmm. of the chemical composition or the star could be rotating, or there could be magnetic field. But these are all perturbations. In the case of black holes too, the mass is the most important. And the smallest mass black holes have, uh, are what are called primordial or mini black holes. And uh, they, these are first talked about by Stephen Hawking. And then that involved uh, the dramatic uh, combination of general relativity and quantum mechanics and the laws of thermodynamics, and then the net result there, and the laws of thermodynamics had been discussed in the black hole context uh, before Hawking's time too. Bekenstein was the one person who did it. And where uh, the laws of black hole, uh, what called dynamics, were put in a form, which made them very similar to the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, and then therefore one had to take a very bold step to say, that look, I mean, if something looks like the laws of thermodynamics, and then it should be associated temperature with it. And that had already been talked about, but Stephen Hawking did a long calculation in which he formalized it all in 1974. And he showed that black holes indeed have a temperature. And then they, they emit radiation and uh, a particle spectrum corresponding to that temperature. And this emission le leads to the loss of the black hole mass in a very indirect way. And eventually, the black hole could completely vanish, having radiated all, all its mass. Except that the rate of radiation uh, is extremely low and can become significant only at around 10 to the minus black hole 10 to the minus 5 grams. And then the question, no, not 5 grams, yeah. And then, then, the, then the question is, where do you make such, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. 
where do you make such black holes how do you make them and uh, they can only be uh, coming out from the cosmological perturbations uh, initial perturbations but i shall not uh, go into that okay then uh, then you have got the stellar mass black holes which come out of the evolution of stars and there you have a mass of between 1 and 100 solar masses right so uh, so your uh, family of, i i myself told you about stellar evolution and mentioned that black holes come out of the most evolution of most massive stars and we'll consider them in detail as we go then you have got uh, these rather mysterious intermediate mass black holes and there is roughly in the range of 100 to 10 to the 5 solar masses now i will mention um, in the later part of my talk that one of the black holes just one moment please just one moment sanjay i am giving a lecture i am giving a lecture on right so uh, so you got 100 to uh, uh, 100 to 100000 solar masses and then i will show you uh, i'll mention that uh, some black holes which have been detected from their gravitational wave emission by ligo have a mass more than 100 solar masses okay but but close to 100 the other intermediate mass black holes were conjectured they could possibly be there but there has been no direct detection Okay, then of course we have got the supermassive black holes. So, which range in mass range roughly is a million solar masses uh, to ten to the twelve solar masses. Okay, and uh, these have been uh, we know that all possibly all galaxies and all active galactic uh, active galaxies harbor very compact, very massive objects, and um, at least the there have been a direct measurement. in our galaxy and as you may have heard and which i may have mentioned at the end of my uh, two talk series uh, that we have even made a image of one of these black holes one black hole one supermassive black hole in our galaxy which is close to the lower mass in this range and another black hole which is much more massive uh, in the active galaxy m87 right so so we now will concentrate on stellar and supermassive black holes except for remarks here and there now we talked about mass um, the mass of black holes now the question is what are the properties do they have <clears throat> so if you look at a particle like an electron it has got uh, we know that electron has got mass it has got spin it has got charge and then it has got other properties associated with it like lepton number and so forth. now black holes are much more pristine objects Okay, and they they can have only three properties. In fact, there is something which John Wheeler had called the no hair theorem, and one can show that uh, when a black hole is formed and when it settles down, all other properties are radiated away uh, to gravitational radiation, and the only properties which are left are mass, spin, and electric charge. Right now, uh, because black holes are born out of the matter which is there in the universe. which is electrically neutral in the large it would mean that it would be very difficult to make a black hole which has got electric charge on it so for all practical purposes a black hole can only have two properties which is the mass and the spin and of course needless to say uh, they are zero size as we'll come to uh, as i'll mention again as i go along so i've got a zero size object which is massive and which has got spin So you may say that how can a zero size object spin? Uh, because when you look at a finite size body, you can imagine it rotating. How can a body with zero size rotate? The answer to that is the electron, which also has zero size, and then which still has a property which is called spin, right? Which has uh, uh, this property, quantum mechanical property, uh, which is called spin, and uh, has many manifestations like uh, the spin of a finite size object. similarly the spin of a black hole also has such manifestations then the properties of a black holes are scale free in the sense that um, the geometry around a black hole um, is the same whether the black hole mass is 10 to the minus 15 gram 5 grams or even it is 10 to the 12 grams 
Okay, the, the gravitational physics of it is completely the same. And of course, but the physical manifestations can be completely different because black holes with different masses will interact differently with the uh, world around them. All right, so now uh, a picture of a black hole. Uh, the, a picture of a black hole is exactly like what you see on the screen here. Uh, it's completely black. There's no radiation coming from it as, as is very famously known. Um, and so if there's a stray black hole, uh, then you wouldn't really be able to uh, see it at all. You can feel the gravitational effect of it. And in fact, uh, earlier this year, uh, in, in February of 2022, um, a paper was published by Kailash Sahu and his collaborators in the US, uh, which says that the first detection of a lone black hole. So there's a, there's a black hole which is wandering around in the galaxy. And there are millions, possibly tens of hundreds of millions of such black holes in the galaxy. It's wandering around, and then it has been detected because of its gravitational lensing properties. So a black hole has because it's equal gravity, that's what you must feel. Otherwise, you wouldn't see anything else coming. But we do have um, spectacular manifestations of black holes. For example, in a stellar mass binary, this is what you'll have in an X-ray binary, where you've got a black hole here, and then, uh, and then you've got a uh, you've got a disk which is going around it, and then uh, th that's because where does the disk come from? So this is a, in a binary system. The other star is a more or less normal star, meaning uh, it is it's normal but not like the sun. It is an evolved star which is very large, like a red giant, let us say. And then matter from it is being pulled into the black hole, uh, and because the matter has angular momentum, it can't just fall inside. We'll discuss these matters in detail later. But it keeps going round and round and round the black hole and forms what is known as accretion disk from which energy is emitted. Right? So therefore, you could have, uh, uh, therefore, you can, in some sense, see a black hole. Again, this is, you get a lot of X-ray emission from it, different kinds of emission. If the circumstances are right, you can have jets, but the jets are not mandatory here. And uh, you get these binary systems. And many, uh, many of the binary systems are known. The other one is when you've got a supermassive black hole, uh, which is at the center of a large galaxy, and then uh, it is fed by matter from the galaxy. So how do you feel it? It is, uh, there can be stars which are going, and then the black hole just grabs a star which happens to come sufficiently close, and then there are tidal, uh, the, there is massive tides which are produced in the body of the star, and the star gets torn apart, and the matter can go into the black hole. And again, you get uh, through many such processes, you get uh, uh, a disk, an accretion disk going around the black hole. And then you can extract energy from the rotation of the black hole, and then you get these very large, powerful jets and so forth. So, what you see is an active galactic nucleus, which in its more extreme manifestations is known as a quasar. Right? So, this is how you see a black hole. But now the idea of the black hole is essentially very abstract. And um, I have no time to go into this, but what you're seeing on the screen right now is what is known as a Penrose diagram for a black hole. So it turns out that uh, when in appropriate coordinates, a black hole to a mathematician would appear like this. So where the blue line that you see here is a singularity at the center of the black hole. And this is a space-time around it. And a black hole can always be paired with a white hole. So just like nothing can escape from a white hole, here um, everything escapes from a black hole, everything escapes from a white hole, and these are two um, adjoined space-like regions. Okay, so so it is, uh, um, so, so what happens here is that if you look at the mathematical solution, uh, then this is the full representation of it. It is not a pillar diagram. I'm showing it to you simply to say that uh, these are these are different manifestations of black hole. Now, this Penrose diagram, of course, you may know, is due to Roger Penrose, and he uh, he is a great mathematical physicist. He is a great mathematical physicist, and then he gives the first singularity theorem, okay, which says that the singularities in Einstein's general theory of relativity are generic in nature. They are not there simply because of the approximations that you are making. And they'll vanish if you had the right way of solving problems. And um, 
Penrose uh, worked closely with Stephen Hawking for the later theorems. And in 2020, he was awarded half the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. He of course made very profound uh, 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 <coughs> research in uh, various aspects of mathematical physics, gravitation theory, and uh, related areas. And uh, he had written many great books. So, um, and uh, now the theory of black holes. I'm not really going to go into any detail about it, but I'm going to tell you something which is essential for the development of which I wish to do. Okay, so first let us take a quick look at Newtonian black holes. I'm sure that you are all very familiar with it. So we have got f is equal to minus g m1 m2 by r square, Newton's law of gravitation. And one of the elementary consequences of it, which you do, uh, I suppose, in your 11th or 12th class now, uh, is the concept of escape velocity. So if I throw up a ball up into uh, the air, uh, then how far it gets depends upon how much is the speed. Right? And then... Uh, you can, if you're, uh, <coughs> you could say, you have to derive the concept of con uh, escape velocity, meaning how far do I need to throw, how fast do I need to throw it so it can escape from Earth's gravitational field. Then its total energy must be zero because that will be the energy at infinity. And from which you know how to derive the escape velocity, which is square root of 2 gm by r. Right? So, so you get this velocity here. And... Um, <coughs> And then if you put in the parameters, this turns out to be about 11.2 kilometers per second. So now uh, you can imagine increasing the mass or decreasing the radius. So as V keeps increasing. And for a right combination, uh, for example, R is equal to GM by C square, uh, then V escape is equal to C. So if, if you had an object, not like the Earth, but with appropriate mass and radius, then uh, light could not escape from. So which means that the black hole will appear to, I mean, it will be dark. You won't be able to see it. But which are not considered to be a disaster in Newton's theory, simply because uh, the velocity of light, speed of light had no particular significance in it. You could always move faster than that. And then this concept of a black hole within Newton's theory came from John Michel in 1784 and by Laplace. I mean, you all work on Laplace's equation and so on in 1795. So where they said essentially that um, body with the right properties would not allow light to escape from it. Now, the situation is far more complex when you come to general theory of relativity, because I'm sure that you have had the lectures where you have been introduced to general relativity. But first, uh, a quick uh, mention of special relativity. So there's the space-time structure. So you know that in special relativity, you have uh, the three dimensions of space and one dimension of time which are combined together into one uh, single space-time. So you have got the Lorentz transformations and all the consequences of the Lorentz transformations with which you are completely familiar, I'm sure. And then one nice elegant way of stating all this is to say that the line element T is square. So in three-dimensional space, your line element is this one. But in four-dimensional space, you've got a T with a minus sign in it. Okay, and then, uh, so if you put it in a spherical polar coordinate, this is what it will look like. And then, uh, you know that this is invariant. So you could postulate that it is invariant and derive everything else from it. Or if you have these transformation equations, then this line element is invariant. And the consequence of this is a light cone, with which, again, you are very familiar. That if I got an event here, meaning if I shine a torch here, then um, I'll get the beam of light Propagating away from me in two dimensions, in, in uh, propagating away from me, and uh, in two dimensions, just x and y. So I'll get a light cone like this. Here it is, in fact, x and t is shown. But if I consider the coordinates x, y, and t, then you can rotate the cone, and you you'll get a proper two-dimensional cone, three-dimensional cone. But we cannot, of course, visualize the four-dimensional space-time. Now the thing about the cone is that if you are sitting here, then at this event, then I can only influence what is inside the upper part of the cone, right? So which is, which is the time-like part of the cone. 
and I can conversely be influenced only by things which are in the bottom part of the code. So that is because I mean, somebody here, for example, could shine a beam of light which arrives right at this event, and which could prevent me from doing it, or uh, from inside one could reach it with a finite velocity. Okay, from short, shorter distances. Whereas uh, here it is space-like, uh, meaning that there cannot be any uh, any communication between event P and event Q, because that would involve uh, that would involve travel faster than light. Right. So, so this idea of a light cone, which you, which is uh, which we are very familiar with in space in special relativity, I'll use it in my further argument. Okay. So, uh, as required. So now from the special theory of relativity, Einstein transited to general theory of relativity. It took him uh, the time from, 19 to, from 1905 to 1915. It was a very tortuous path, extremely interesting. But at the end of it, because you know very well that Einstein could show that uh, elementary theory is completely compatible with special relativity. Newton's theory was not the dynamics of particles. So there he had to uh, introduce the Lorentz transformation equations and then make everything compatible with that. And in the process, he got the equivalence between energy and mass. But he found it impossible to unify gravity with special relativity. And so therefore, he, he uh, discovered, went out to discover the general theory of relativity, in which there are, in special theory of relativity, you know that the initial frames, which you don't have in general theory of relativity, and then matter curves space time and particles move along the geodesics of space time. Right? So then you've got his equations here. And these equations, this is a set of 10 nonlinear tensorial equations, which are known as Einstein's field equations. The term on the right contains the properties of matter and energy. And on the left, you have got think what you know the metric tensor. These tensors are built out of the metric tensor. And if once you solve this and you get the metric, then you can solve the geodesic equation, which tell you how particles and light will move in the geometry. And so uh, now uh, what I'm concerned with most here is the first exact solution of Einstein's theory, which was given by the great astrophysicist uh, <coughs> Karl Schwarzschild, uh, who was at the, in the battlefield in the First World War. Okay, and then um, he, the solution that he discovered is a solution corresponding to um, a point mass. So we have already seen in Newton's theory that if your two particles attract each other with a force m1, m2, g m1, m2 by r square, so you can just take one particle and you can say that the potential due to that one particle is minus g m by r. So if I put a test particle with a small mass m, then the force would be minus G capital M small m by R. The potential would be minus G capital M by R. Right? So now you've got a corresponding solution here. So you've got a you've got a particle, a point particle, uh, which is sitting at the center of the coordinate, spherical polar coordinate system. Then the metric that you get looks like this. So compare that with uh, compare that. Uh, with the metric uh, of special relativity. Okay, so there, uh, this is, you, you can easily make a transformation so that this becomes minus dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Right, so this is the me metric of spa flat space time. But this metric here, you see that because spherical polar coordinates, this part is the same, but the coefficients of r, dr squared and dt squared are quite different. And, and, and because this shows you that space time there is curved. And then from this solution, you can work out everything about the geometry, as you'll see in the next few slides. So, first of all, uh, if you look at these coefficients here, now I put g is equal to 1 and c is equal to 1. So, this would be 2gm by c square r, 2gm by c square r. So, you'll see here that when r is equal to 2m, that is r is equal to 2 gm by c square. Okay, then you see that this becomes zero and this becomes infinitely large. So the question is, do you have a singularity here? Is it growing up? 
And then it turns out that the singularity is simply the singularity of the origin of coordinates. The singularity due to the coordinate system used. Now here, for example, when you put r is equal to zero, you run into a problem. Okay, and then there'll also be a problem at the poles and so on. But then you can easily have a different coordinate system and eliminate those problems. Now it turns out that here too, you've got a whole series of coordinate systems like the Eddington Finkelstein coordinate system and the Kruskal Zekeri's coordinate system and so on, where the singularity at R is equal to 2M does not occur. So therefore, there is no singularity there. But nevertheless, there's a physically very important thing which happens at R is equal to 2M, as we'll see. On the other hand, at R is equal to 0, when this term blows up and this term blows up, it turns out that there's a real physical singularity. Right, so now what you can do uh, uh, what you can do here is that you can work out the light cones there. So what are the light cones? How do we how do we get the light cones in special relativity? We just put ds square is equal to zero. For example, just one time and one space dimension, ds square gives you minus dt square plus dx square is equal to zero. So which means that dt by dx is equal to plus minus one. Okay, and that is what uh, <coughs> See, that is what gave you these light cones that you see here. Right, so similarly, what one could do here is put T S square is equal to zero, because that again will be the trajectory of, uh, so that is satisfied for light rays. And when you do that, and you, when you uh, get the light cones, because of the curvature of space time, uh, the structure of the light cone can be quite different. So you have got a particle sitting here at R is equal to zero, and as you go further and further, as you tend to R and to infinity, then uh, then you expect that space time will be flat there. And therefore, you also expect that the light cones should look more or less like the light cones of uh, special relativity. But as you come closer, and when you when you derive the equation of the light cone, you can see here clearly that the light cone is tilting towards R is equal to zero. And then when you come to R is equal to Rs, which is the Schwarzschild radius, which is equal to 2 gm by c square, when you come to that, then you see that one arm of the light cone um, is lying along R is equal to constant um, over here. And then the, the time-like part of the light cone, which is the future light cone, which is all pointing towards R is equal to C. So for example, if you look at this light cone and imagine throwing up a particle here, now, if the particle is directed towards uh, R is equal to zero, it may fall inside. But if it is directed outwards, then it will go off on some tra trajectory outwards. But here you see, every particle must move inside the future light cone. So it should mean that all particles will land up at R is equal to zero. So, and then light rays. One light ray gets stuck here, which is very interesting and very important. And the other light rays are all pointing R is equal to C. So you see that, uh, so that is why R is equal to TM, 2M, there is no singularity, but nevertheless, it's a very profoundly important, uh, it's a very profoundly important uh, uh, quantity surface, R is equal to 2M, because nothing from inside that surface, nothing can escape to, uh, uh, to infinity. Right, so we saw this happening in Newton's theory too, but there it did not really matter to us. But here, the fact that no light ray can escape means that no signal can escape from inside the event horizon to the outside. And so the black hole is completely cut off. So what happens in the Schwarzschild black hole? Now, this is just a pictorial representation. Is that you have got you have got a black hole sitting at the center with zero radius, and it has got finite mass, and therefore it has got infinite matter density. So in every sense of the word, it is a singularity. And then you have got this surface, which is known as an event horizon, and which is whose R Schwarzschild is equal to 2 gm by c squared. And as I have explained to you, nothing can escape from the inside to the outside. And what is the numerical value of the event horizon? So you see that uh, <coughs> this is for a, for a black hole. Uh, so I have normalized it to 10 to the 8 solar masses. Okay, so if you have got a black hole of 10 to the 8 solar masses, then the Schwarzschild radius will be 3 into 10 to the 8 
kilometers. Now, supposing I got uh, <coughs> <coughs> what happens in the case of the sun? So, in the case of the sun, the mass is 10 to the minus 8 in units of 10 to the 8 solar masses. And therefore, the 10 to the 8 and 10 to the minus 8 cancel. And you, what you get is just 3 kilometers. So, if, the, if you got a black hole of the mass of the sun, then the rate, then the event horizon of that would have a size of three kilometers. All right. <clears throat> so um, I have I have now finished uh, with a general survey of this black hole thing. Uh, but what I am now going to do is to introduce you to the concept of an effective potential. Now I am sure that again you people have come across this. Though possibly not in the kind of detail that I'm going to go into. But I'm just going to do it in just a few slides. But these are exceedingly interesting calculations. They give you a lot of insight into the behavior of the space-time around the black hole and what you actually see around the black hole. And I will urge you to consider going through these calculations. So in uh, when I was first learning general relativity, there were hardly any books at all. And then there, there were only... Uh, there were a couple of textbooks written in the old style, and then uh, there was this. Uh, there's a you must all know about the books by Landau and Lipschitz. The Landau and Lipschitz of classical electrodynamics uh, has got two or three two chapters on general relativity. And then uh, quite soon in the early 1970s, uh, uh, around 74 or 75, there was a very very fat book called Gravitation Return. And that's a great marvel. And then, of course, now you have got lots and lots of textbooks. So now let us take a, a quick recap of classical mechanics. So now you know if I if I ask you if I tell you that there is a r phi coordinates and then uh, uh, polar coordinates and then there's a particle moving in these coordinates, then what would be ask you to write down the Lagrangian? So what is the Lagrangian? The Lagrangian is equal to kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And let us suppose that the potential is due to is a gravitational potential. Then the term for kinetic energy is mv square. And v square, as you know, is r dot square plus r square pi dot square. This is all trivial. It can be very easily done. So this is the kinetic energy of the particle. And this is the potential energy. And what is the expression for the potential energy? We are is equal to minus g m, m by r. So this is not the potential, but the potential energy of the particle. Now, uh, now you see that I can write down what the angular momentum of the particle, and that is equal to m r squared pi dot squared. Right, so this is, uh, so you see here, because this potential is not, it's spherically symmetric potential, you can very easily show that the angular momentum of a particle moving in this potential is a constant. Okay, then what is the energy of the particle? That is equal to the kinetic energy, which is equal to this term, plus the potential energy Vr, plus you remember, but the Vr comes to the negative side. So this is the total energy of the particle. Now, using L is equal to this expression and the energy, I can write down the total energy as half m r dot square minus g m by r, g m m by r, plus l square upon twice m r square. Now, this is a very important expression, but we'll make it a little bit more easy to understand, is that I introduced the concept here of energy per unit mass of the particle, not the gravitating particle, but the test particle, energy per unit mass of the test particle, and angular momentum per unit mass of the test particle. Then the total energy can be written as epsilon is equal to half r dot square plus v effective, where v effective is equal to this particular potential. So you see that uh, why does this term come in here in the potential now? That's because first of all, this is the uh, simple gravitational attraction and uh, gravitational potential. And this one here, the second term, L square by twice r square, so that is equal to the centrifugal term. So you understand that because the particle is not moving in a circle, 
uh, there will be a centrifugal force acting on it. And so this is the centrifugal term. So it is this V effective potential that we are going to study further now. So you look at this here. Is I got here in the diagram, what I've done is that I've plotted <coughs> V effective against R. So and then I get this very elegant curve on it. So where does this curve come from? So you see that here uh, we have, uh, <coughs> uh, in this case, as R tends to infinity, it still go to zero. Right, so it, it goes to zero. Then as R decreases to smaller and smaller values, first this term will dominate. Okay, so uh, because R is large, R is large and slowly decreasing, so this term will dominate, this term will be very small, and so you get this minus one upon R uh, fall. But gradually this term also starts becoming larger as R decreases further, and then you can show very quickly that it passes through a minimum here and then as R becomes small, then this term dominates, which is positive, and so the potential rises. So you see that, <coughs> uh, so the potential has this elegant shape because of that. Now, how do we use this potential? We want to see how a particle moves in this potential. So a particle is represented, this is not actually the path of the particle, but this is the part of the this is the energy of the particle. So if you give me an energy, any particular energy, then I know where I can place it in this diagram. So now if you if you consider this particular uh, energy, you see that the particle as R tends to infinity clearly, the energy has to remain constant. So if R is equal to infinity, now then what happens is that the particle has got finite energy. It will be moving with a certain velocity at infinitely large distance. But if I if I put a thing here which coincides with this red line, then it will be a particle which as R tends to infinity will be at rest. Right? But a particle with energy like this, with total energy is negative, that cannot escape it. Because at infinity, energy cannot be negative. And therefore, a particle with energy like this gets trapped here, which is R minimum and R maximum. But these are energies. This is not configuration space. And what will be the, actually the shape of the trajectories? Very simple. So this one here is a. I can, I can imagine a particle coming in, moving here. And it, what what does it mean? At this point, you have got E is equal to V effect, which means dr by dt is equal to c. So up to this point, R decreases and then R increases. So what happens here? Just look at this. So this is a trajectory in which a particle will come in from infinity in this orbit, comes to a minimum distance, hits this point, this point, and then goes off to infinity. But here you've got the same, so and you can show that this is actually a hyperbola. And here for the green curve, <coughs> then you can show that for a curve like this, uh, it is like the hyperbola except that at infinity, and the velocity is zero, and the shape is a parabola. But the most interesting one is this closed curve, and you can show that it is an ellipse. Right? So now imagine a particle which is sitting here, a particle which is in an ellipse like this at this point. What will happen if I decrease the energy of that particle, leaving the angular moment of the constant? Then, then what will happen is that <coughs> it, uh, it, uh, it just keeps going. R1 keeps increasing, R2 keeps decreasing until I extract en enough energy, and then the particle lands up at the minimum of the potential. And there it will be the stable point, and then the orbit will be a circle. So the, the, the net effect is that, if you have the smallest amount of angular moment, if you have zero angular momentum and you throw a particle uh, towards R is equal to zero, it will fall into R is equal to zero. But if I got the smallest amount of angular momentum, then the particle, will always bounce back. Because eventually the centrifugal force dominates the gravitational force and it bounces back. So please understand that all this is uh, within Newtonian theory. Now let us see what happens in, uh, in the Schwarzschild potential. So there our job is done now. In Newtonian theory, this is the energy, this was the effective potential. It turns out very gratifyingly that in if you do the the Lagrangian calculation 
the something which is the calculation of the Jewell sticks not the Lagrangian uh, within Schwarzschild geometry, then you can write down an exactly similar expression, except that the time coordinate there is now replaced by the proper time, and then V effective is replaced by a Schwarzschild V effective. And what does that do? That introduces an extra term minus G M then square by R T. And so because the effect of general relativity. And all this is exact because you have got the exact Schwarzschild solution, and we have exactly solved. We exactly looked at the uh, geodesics in this geometry, and all that we get is an extra term minus g m l square bar q. Now, just look at it. We have seen that at r tends to infinity, v is zero. As you come close by, so first this dominates, so you have got a decreasing potential. Then the centrifugal force dominates, so you've got an increasing potential. But now you'll clearly see that when R becomes very small, the one upon R cube term dominates, and therefore you will get so you will get a uh, uh, you get again a negative part. So look at decreasing part. So look at this solution now. Uh, this is the effective potential for uh, uh, for Newtonian theory. And the effective potential for the Schwarzschild theory is there when you go down, you hit the minimum, <coughs> you go up like very much like the Newtonian potential, except that you get a maximum and then you come down again. Right? So, <coughs> so what would happen is that, and you please, uh, the very important thing is that this shape of the potential is for a fixed angular moment. Now, when we change the angular momentum, what happens? We'll see soon. So now, so now you see here. <coughs> what is the net result of this minimum? Is that if I got a particle with sufficiently high energy, then regardless of its angular momentum, if I throw it at r is equal to zero at the black hole, it will fall into the black hole because it can bypass. It just goes over the maximum. In Newtonian theory, the maximum is at infinity, so you can never get over. So even if you have angular momentum in Schwarzschild theory, you can still fall into the black hole. Right? And what are the trajectories of the particle? Uh, so you see, <clears throat> I showed you a trajectory like this, where the particle comes from infinity and goes to infinity. And then you, here, this is the kind of trajectory which does not exist in Newtonian theory. And this one, so, <clears throat> so it is finite angular momentum, but enough energy. So it comes in from infinity and just spirals into the black hole. Right? <clears throat> because the particles are not traveling in straight line, they're spiraling into the black hole. And then, <clears throat> then you see, <clears throat> then there's the other interesting thing, is that if you've got a particle sitting exactly at the minimum of the potential, right, then you will get a circular orbit, which we have also seen in Newton's theory. But you can sit at the maximum of the potential and still get a circular orbit. Okay, but except that, this orbit is unstable because if you perturb it slightly, either you go to infinity or you fall into the black hole. And this orbit is a stable orbit. But now an important change. We saw <coughs> in the Newtonian theory, uh, we saw that if you have got something like this, negative energy, then we got, <coughs> uh, in the Newtonian theory, we got an ellipse. Now, um, when you come to Einstein's theory, because of the extra term 1 upon R cube, it turns out that you get nearly an ellipse. And this is a very exaggerated thing. You get nearly an ellipse, but the ellipse is not closed. Okay, so which means that as the particle goes around the black hole, the ellipse will be rotating slightly. And that is what is known as the precession of the perillion. And uh, then you will have heard, I'm sure, that Einstein, there was a there was a residual precession of the perillion of Mercury, which was not explained by Newton's gravitation and was exactly explained by general relativity, without the need for introducing any constant or making any adjustment. Okay, that is because <coughs> there are no closed orbits in 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 general relativity in the Schwarzschild metric. Okay, so now uh, let me go ahead with this and uh, now let us look at different potentials. So what happens here? If I take a fixed angular momentum, mm -hmm. um, which is 4.5, which is in some units or the other, and you see that the kind of potential comes in from infinity, goes up, 
maximum income stock. As I decrease the ideal income, ah, then, uh, then you see uh, the height of the barrier to decrease. Right? And then, uh, and then you can go, here you have got R minimum, where the uh, minimum of the potential occurs, which is out, which is the outer uh, extremum, and R maximum. Okay, so, so here at the maximum of the potential, it is this one. Now, as you go on decreasing the, you go on decreasing the angular momentum, when you reach this value of 2 root 3 in these units angular momentum, then what happens is that, um, you see, it is this term becomes equal to 1. Okay, and therefore, this term vanishes. And so you will get R minimum is equal to R maximum. Okay, meaning that the maximum and the minimum, <coughs> they, uh, the maximum and the minimum, they coincide. And that happens at a radius, which is three times the Schwarzschild radius. But one also use a more generalizable radius called the gravitational radius, which is half the Schwarzschild radius. So the Schwarzschild radius is two GM by six square, but the gravitational radius is <coughs> <clears throat> it's just gm by c square. Okay, so so what happens here is that when this happens, um, uh, when this coincides, there's a very important consequence. You see that for a potential like this, we have seen that there is a elliptical near elliptical orbit possible. So it's a stable orbit. You put a particle in that orbit, it will go on and on. But once you come to this, with the maximum and minimum coincide. Then there is no, uh, then there is no stable orbit. Okay, so which would mean that uh, for this angular momentum and for any angular momentum which is less than that, regardless of the value of the angular momentum and regardless of the value of the energy, the particle will always fall into the black hole. Because as you go sufficiently close to the black hole, gravity becomes so strong, the space-time curvature is so high that everything is grabbed inside. Nothing can ever escape. This is a manifestation of that. So I'm sure I'm sure that if there was a this were a live face-to-face -face lecture, then that's on several occasions I would have asked you to ask me questions, and I'm sure that all of you have several questions. And please feel to ask them when I stop in a few more minutes. And uh, I just go ahead a little bit and stop. So what happens here? Now we are considered the potential so far, first in the Newtonian theory, and then in general relativity, the Schwarzschild metric. We are considered the potential uh, for a massive particle. Right? But now what happens if the photon orbits? And you really don't know how to deal with photon orbits uh, in Newton's theory. And you can do all kinds of provisional estimates like Laplace and uh, John Michel did. But on the other hand, here we have got a perfect formalism for it. And the geodesics for the zero mass particles like photons and neutrinos are called, uh, so they are called, uh, they are called null geodesics. And then when you've got null geodesics and you work out the effective potential, you can do, you can follow exactly the same steps that you do to work out the potential for a massive particle. When you work out the effective potential, then you see, you get uh, you get this form of the potential. And what is the most important difference between this and uh, the massive particles is that there is no minimum. Okay, so you can't trap, you can't trap a photon in a, <coughs> in a, in a thing. But it turns out that because uh, neutrinos are spin-off particles, it is possible to trap them in some ways, but I won't go into that. Okay, so that is the calculation I did Professor Vishweshwara many decades ago. So then, uh, then you, uh, so you see that there's only one point at which you could have a stable orbit, an orbit, closed orbit, and that is if you're sitting on the top of the potential. And what will be the shape of the orbit? You see, R is equal to constant, exactly as in the case of the massive particles, and then you will get a circle. Right, but this is an unstable orbit. I mean, you perturb the photon slightly, and then you go in or you go out. Right, so, and then these are the other orbits, of course. So here, it comes from infinity, goes to infinity. And here, the photon, come, photon comes from infinity and spirals into the black hole. 
But this orbit, I mean, I have, I first studied it uh, when I was just starting my PhD, and uh, I found it very interesting. But they did not say, "Man, this is nonsense." And how will you trap a photon there? But the the first image of a black hole was obtained by using this trapped <coughs> this trapped part photons here. Uh, the thing. Okay, and this happens at a radius of one point five times the Schwarzschild radius. Which is three times the gravitational radius, right? So if you uh, so if you have got a black hole and this is the horizon, so apart from the horizon, this this image is about the scale, of course. Uh, so then you you get your trapped photons, which are going round and round the black hole, but because there's spherical symmetry, it is not a circle that you get, but you will get a sphere. Okay, and this sphere is known as the photon sphere. All right. Just a few, uh, so a few lines of introduction to rotating black holes. So you can, uh, the Schwarzschild solution was derived in 1916, one year after general theory of relativity was announced by Einstein. The next important solution uh, came only in 1963. There are of course there are other Schwarzschild related important solutions like the Weinstein metric, which came in 1948 and which is the metric corresponding to a radiating star. With Professor P. C. Vaidya, uh, uh, who he uh, was a student of the senior Dalikar, uh, Professor Jay Dalikar's father, the senior Dalikar, and Vaidya derived this very important metric, which is known as the Vaidya metric. But the solution corresponding to a rotating black hole came much later, in 1963, and uh, it is uh, by uh, a person called Roy Kerr, so who was uh, Australian. And this is a great solution, and uh, and you see, I already told you black holes can have mass and spin. So this is the solution corresponding to mass. Mass is Schwarzschild. Spin uh, uh, spin is uh, the Kerr solution. And when you generalize the spinning black hole solution to the black hole which has electric charge, then you get what is known as a Kerr Newman metric. Okay, but as we have seen. The charge is really not possible in astrophysical situations. Okay, so uh, the Kerr metric is much more complicated than the uh, Schwarzschild metric, as you can expect. That is why it was discovered so much into the future. And if you put the angular momentum is equal to zero, so the spin is equal to zero, then you'll recover the Schwarzschild metric. Okay, and then uh, there are all kinds of crazy things involved with this metric. First of all, the singularity is not a point. The singularity is uh, actually like a disk. Then, um, then you've got a you've got two event horizons, but outer event horizon and inner event horizon, and outside the outer event horizon, but touching it at the poles, is you get something called an ergosphere, and which has got important properties like the fact that uh, nothing, if if you enter the ergosphere, then you can you can't remain steady at a place. It doesn't matter how powerful a rocket you are using, you can't remain steady at a place. You must keep going around the black hole. Because so that's called the ergosphere. Okay, now uh, you can work out. Now this is going to be my last two slides. You can work out here in the ergosphere. Uh, uh, you can uh, you can work out what's the innermost orbit. So you remember that in the Schwarzschild case, the innermost orbit is six rg, six times the gravitational radius. So here we have got the angular momentum of the black hole divided by the mass. Okay, and here you have got the radius of the innermost stable circular orbit. So when a is equal to zero, then that the black hole has no angular momentum, then you get the the curve solution reduces to the Schwarzschild solution. Okay, so in which case you must have the innermost stable circular orbit R is co to be the six times R G. But now, when when I got a rotating particle, then the the stable orbit, the innermost stable orbit, it depends upon whether the test particle is co-rotating, meaning that if it is going around the black hole, in the same sense that the black hole is rotating, that's called co-rotating. If it is going around in the opposite sense, it's called counter-rotating. Okay, so then <coughs> then you see. Then, as the angular momentum increases, you see the maximum angular momentum that you can have is a is equal to m, and the 
you cannot you cannot go beyond n. That this parameter a by n cannot be more than one because the solution doesn't exist for it. Okay, and as you approach this value asymptotically, then you will find that the innermost table orbit goes to R G. So in the Schwarzschild case, it is as much as six R G, and in this case, it becomes <coughs> one R G, and that in practice is extremely important because um, because you see it is like this um, when if you got a particle, as I told you. Uh, you got a particle which is from which you are extracting. In order for a particle to move inwards, you have to extract energy from the particle because as you move inwards, the energy becomes more and more negative. And what is the maximum? What is the minimum value that you can uh, reach here? So you see that uh, for a is equal to, for for a non-rotating black hole, you know that it is equal to this particular value, and there it turns out. That the amount of energy that you can extract from the particle by the time it reaches that orbit is uh, is about uh, so it is about uh, so it is about six percent of the mass of the particle. Right. So just imagine a particle which is falling inside. You have to keep on extracting energy from it, which can be a source of energy. And what the maximum amount of energy that you can You can extract from it. It reaches the last stable orbit, and beyond that, it will just fall off into the black hole. Okay, and that is point zero five seven minute about. So point zero six. So this is uh, so to get the percentage of the mass extracted. So you multiply by hundred, and you get about six percent. But then, if you have got a co-rotating hole, and then it turns out that one minus e is point four two for an extreme curved black hole. Maximally rotating black hole, and the amount of energy extracted is close to uh, <coughs> is 0.4. That is 42 percent of the energy can be extracted, and uh, because this is a theoretical limit, which will never be reached. And then, supposing a by n is equal to 0.998, it increases with. Now, uh, how else can you extract energy from a particle? You can energy. How do stars get? How do we power stars? We have seen that that happens because of the conversion of hydrogen to heat. Then, so and then, then and then mass loss and delta m by m there is equal to 0.008, about 0.08, 0.09, like that, depending on the details of the situation. So, which means that it is less than one percent. So, the efficiency of powering a star by nuclear energy, extracting energy through conversion of hydrogen. Go, uh, go straight from hydrogen to helium, uh, to hydrogen to iron. Then it's only about one percent. But here, if you have got a way of extracting energy, about forty-two percent. So Penrose has given a way of extracting energy. And Professor Narendra Pradeep and his group many years ago also gave a different way of extracting energy from it, uh, from a black hole like this. Okay, all right. Now. Uh, I have finished giving the kind of background uh, here, and uh, I must apologize if the matter was too much for you, uh, but I can't help that. And then next time I'll go into more uh, familiar territory for you because I already showed you these slides, and it is the uh, <clears throat> it is the formation of stellar mass black holes. All right, now uh, I have, my time is up, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. You can ask them. Orally, or you could uh, type them in. Akshat Patrikar. Uh, hello, sir. Yes, please. Uh, sir, my question is that is singularity inside a black hole is something real or is it uh, a term to hide our ignorance because we don't know what's inside a black hole? Uh, uh, you see, uh, 
the theorems of Penrose and Hawking. And um, if I get the time, uh, if I get the time, then I'll just refer to them at the end of my lecture tomorrow. And uh, they show that a black hole, I mean, there's a lot of speculation that it, see, after all, where did the singularity occur? In the, in the Schwarzschild court, in the Schwarzschild case. It is spherical symmetry. So people said that it is because of spherical symmetry. Where else does the singularity occurs? It occurs in the Big Bang. But, but the, the, the whole of the cosmology is derived under the assumption that the universe is homogeneous and asymptotic. So in particular, the Russian, you know, the, the Lifshitz of the land of Lifshitz fame. Uh, so he and his group for many years, for 10 years, they worked on proving that there is a, that, that a general solution of Einstein's theory, which has no uh, singularity. Okay, but then uh, they, they believe that they are proved it. I spent a lot of time reading those extremely difficult papers. Uh, but then it turned out that when, then in the 1960s, uh, Hawking and uh, Penrose, they gave these theorems, which showed that singularities are inescapable part of general relativity. Okay, so these are real, these are real singularities, and you have to learn them. Maybe the hope and expectation is that when you go to quantum gravity, they will not occur, but that remains to be seen. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah. Any other question? I'm sure that there will be some question. Don't be afraid to ask. Ask even if it's a very simple thing, very crazy thing. Just go ahead and ask. Pushti Srimankar. Yes, yes, please. Sir, so, uh, my question about, uh, as you explained, the light cones near the event horizon. So, sir, my question is that when the R is increased, the length of the light cone would decreases. So, what is the re reason behind it? Uh, R is increased, what decreases? Uh, length of the light cones. Well, one moment. I just saw that. No, 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 no. Nothing decreases. Those are, those are simply drawings. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. It is just that what is important there is that the light cone is bending. Okay? And then, then you see also the other thing which doesn't come out in the diagram because it's only a symbolic diagram is that um, in, in flat space, the, the sides of the light cone, they are, they are straight lines. Okay? In general relativity, they are not straight lines. They are curved because space time is curved. All those things are not shown. What is important is that the light cone starts bending and the tilting, not bending, but tilting. It's also bent. And then it tilts fully. When you reach the event horizon, it is fully tilted towards the singularity, except for one arm of it, which is along the R is equal to 2L. But if you move further inwards, then the whole of the light cone is pointing inside. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. I understood. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, I want to know about the difference between this uh, event horizon and ergosphere. And uh, okay. how so does even, this uh, light sphere light sphere also is there, no? Yeah, you see that light sphere. Yeah, these are yeah these are good questions. In order to understand them, you have to actually do the calculations yourself and think about them. Uh, what happens is that. Let us say that in the let's do look at this Schwarzschild case. So there we have got the event horizon from which nothing can escape from inside of it. Right? Uh, so that is something that is very absolute. Then when we look at the trajectory of photons, so we find that the potential has got a maximum. And that maximum occurs at R is equal to 1.5 times of Schwarzschild. So outside the event horizon. But because there is a maximum there, you can have a trajectory where the light goes round and round and round. Okay? So, because if you put a photon at that point, it is trapped at that point. Right? What, what do you mean trap? R is equal to constant. What is the R equal to constant? In, if it is not R and T, then R theta and T. R is equal to constant means a circle. Right? And so, it will be a circle in a plane. But because of isotropy, we can say that no. It is more like a sphere. It's not a circle. A circle is just a section. So if you if you drop a lot of photons onto the uh, a lot of photons onto the uh, to a black hole, 
then some of them will get trapped at the surface. Okay, and then there will be a photon sphere. Now, uh, when you go to uh, when you go to Schwarzschild, when you go to the rotating black hole, the curved geometry, uh, there uh, there you can have all kinds of uh, all these singularities will be there, but they are much more complex. But in addition to the event horizon, you've got one more surface which is known as an ergosphere. Now you can go inside an ergosphere and it can come out. So it is not it is not like the event horizon. But the fact is that if you go inside an ergosphere, then um, the drag because of the spin of the black hole is so heavy that you can never ever remain in one place. You necessarily will be dragged around uh, to rotate around the black hole. That is the that is the thing of the ergosphere, and it's called an ergosphere because ergo earth is the energy. Because there are there are ways in which you can extract. Rotational energy from the atmosphere. Any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, I will stop now and I'll see you again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Thank you.